There is no denying that psychological and emotional problems, even severe mental distress, can affect most anyone. But does this mean we are all insane? What causes psychological distress? Early psychiatrists thought it was an imbalance of the humors that could only be cured by bleeding patients with knives or leeches. Other psychiatrists believe mental problems came from organs like the tonsils, the stomach, and the spleen, and cut them out. Later were attempts to alter brain function, but these efforts also failed. Today, psychiatrists tell us that the way to fix unwanted behavior is by balancing brain chemistry with a pill. Did they get it right this time? They say you have a chemical imbalance of serotonin and dopamine, but there's never been a study to ever prove that, ever. It's just been indoctrinated into the culture and television advertising to the point where people now believe it is fact. Despite this lack of evidence, psychiatrists will tell you that psychotropic drugs are just like mainstream medical drugs. Can this be true? The answer is that unlike a drug such as insulin that corrects a measurable and proven imbalance in the body, psychotropic medications have no visible or measurable physical abnormality to correct. Here is evidence of a bacterial infection. Here is the psychiatric disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Here is a broken arm. Here is major depressive disorder. This is a brain tumor. And this is bipolar disorder. Which raises the question, how can you medicate something that is not physically there? The answer is, you can't. And furthermore, because psychotropic drugs are specifically designed to get past the body's natural defenses and into the brain, they can upset the very delicate processes the brain needs to ensure the body runs smoothly. Every time you throw something into the system that's foreign to the system, you're creating imbalances elsewhere within the system. The body changes as a result of taking the medication, so when you stop taking the medication, the body's got to change back to the way it was before if it can, because it can't always. And in doing so, it disrupts the whole system. This is what creates the sometimes serious side effects. Paxil was the drug that gave me insomnia. Uh, I would cry very easily on it, and I completely lost my appetite within the first two days of taking it. It didn't help me study. It didn't help me do anything. I didn't even want to do work, because I was so sick. Psych meds didn't help me at all. They made matters, uh, I'd say, probably like 10 times worse for me, maybe even 20. Only now, I was further impaired by the medications, and I started having car accidents. They put me on Zoloft, and it made me want to kill myself. And I realized that those drugs were just destroying me. Even when I was on them, I realized that they were destroying me. In spite of the crippling effects of their drugs, psychiatrists and drug companies have used them to create a huge and lucrative market worth billions. And they've done this by naming more and more of life's problems as medical disorders requiring psychiatric treatment. For example, shyness becomes social anxiety disorder, loss of a loved one, major depressive disorder, homesickness, separation anxiety, suspicion, paranoid personality disorder, having ups and downs, bipolar disorder, Distractibility, ADHD. This is why it is almost impossible for anyone to see a psychiatrist today and not be diagnosed with a mental illness. And a diagnosis of mental illness means psychotropic drugs. When a patient goes into a psychiatrist's office and asks for help, probably 98, 99, maybe even 99.9% .9 of people are gonna receive a medication. And these medications have been estimated to cause over 700,000 serious adverse reactions a year and 42,000 deaths. Meanwhile, the psychiatric industry rakes in a third of a trillion dollars a year. The issue isn't whether or not people's emotional problems are real. They are. What we really should be asking is, how did psychiatrists convince people that these problems were signs of mental illness? How did they use these illnesses to create a demand by doctors and the public for psychotropic drugs? 
And how did these drugs, with no known curative powers and a long list of side effects, become the standard treatment for every problem in life? Psychiatrists assert that they have made much progress in the field of mental health over the past century and a half. To prove this, they claim a history of great advancements in the area of psychotropic drugs. But is this parade of brain chemicals the scientific breakthroughs they are leading us to believe? Modern institutional psychiatry has depended on psychotropic drugging since its earliest beginnings in insane asylums during the 19th century. During that period, psychiatrists functioned almost exclusively as attendants, promising to cure the seriously mentally ill. But as they could not, they were not regarded by mainstream medicine as real doctors. Other physicians considered psychiatrists as almost a doctor. <laughs> Okay, because they weren't doing medical stuff. So to increase their status, they needed to become much more scientific. They need to prove that this is a legitimate scientific field. This is a legitimate medical profession. So they start medicalizing everything. To control behavioral outbursts amongst inmates, psychiatrists employed early psychotropic drugs, such as morphine and opium. But contrary to their claims, these drugs cured nothing and proved to be highly addictive. This led to a whole new generation of dependents, a solution far worse than the original problem. But the attempts to control objectionable behavior continued, and by the turn of the 20th century, phony cures for mental illness, such as heroin, could be found being peddled throughout the United States and Europe. Even psychologist Sigmund Freud played a major role in the creation of the cocaine industry in the Western world, writing many glowing articles promoting its use for spiritual distress and behavioral difficulties. Freud, as a psychoanalyst, uh, he, for a while, was promoting cocaine as being a panacea for all kinds of problems. Freud later wrote, the psychic effect of cocaine moriaticum consists of acceleration and lasting euphoria, produced no compulsive desire to use the stimulant further. What Freud did not reveal was a significant conflict of interest involving two rival pharmaceutical giants, Merck and Park Davis, both paying him to endorse their respective cocaine extracts. Sigmund Freud's early psychotropic drug marketing campaign helped create a major cocaine epidemic throughout Europe at the turn of the century. Clearly, another happy pill would have to be found. It wouldn't take long. Psychiatrists in the first half of the 20th century next turned to amphetamines. As before, the hype subsided into unavoidable proof that the drugs not only were ineffective, but highly toxic and addictive. Each fad followed the same pattern. First, the drug would be hailed as a medical breakthrough for mental problems. Then, increasing reports of serious side effects would trickle in. Finally, after years of denial, when psychiatrists and pharmaceutical companies could no longer deny the dangers of the drug, they would abandon it in favor of their next wonder drug. Though none of their drug therapies had ever proven to cure anything, psychiatrists continued their search for a magic bullet that they supposed would cure all. And in 1954, their dream, they believed, was realized with the introduction of psychiatry's first so-called miracle drug, chlorpromazine, better known as Thorazine. Originally designed and tested as a synthetic dye, then as an antiparasitic in pigs, Thorazine was accidentally discovered to shut down human motor controls. One of the first papers promoting its psychiatric use stated, the aim is to produce a state of motor retardation, emotional indifference, and somnolence. Thorazine was considered the uh, uh, chemical lobotomy. Instead of cutting off the frontal lobes of the brain uh, with an ice pick, uh, you didn't have to do that kind of surgery. You, you could do it with a drug. 
Thorazine proved so lucrative in immobilizing patients exhibiting unwanted behavior that its maker, Smith, Klein & French, organized a major promotional campaign around the drug, including paying influential psychiatrists as speakers, organizing media campaigns, and even producing national television shows, a prelude to the mass drug marketing we see all around us today. Thorazine at that time was thought of as a miracle because it was able to reduce the symptoms of, of uh, psychosis and schizophrenia at that time that they knew about it. Um, and um, it emptied all of the um, psychiatric housing units. The campaign was wildly successful. Smith, Klein & French's income soared by over 500% in the following two decades, with Thorazine supplying over a third of the drug company's revenues in 1970. Eventually, an estimated 250 million people worldwide had been on Thorazine and drugs in its class, 23% more than the entire population of the United States. The floodgates had been opened. SKF and the psychiatrists on its payroll had proved that, through marketing, there could be big money in psychiatric drugs. But it wasn't long before Thorazine was revealed to have problems of its own. Thorazine chronically led to really serious problems such as tardive dyskinesia, which is a movement disorder that's very, very bothersome, and uh, supposedly it's irreversible. The tongue darting, you know, the, the muscle jerking, you know, the eyes rolling back in the head. Most people were sometimes permanently damaged by it, so they were going to have to live their life with uh, this neurological problem that was actually created by the pharmaceutical industry with their medication. Because Thorazine so hindered mental functioning, its use had to be limited to institutions. But with big money at stake, the race was on to discover a psychiatric drug that could be taken out of the institutions and into the hands of a much wider, vaster, and more lucrative market, the general public. Since they were emptying the institutions of all these psychotic patients with the advent of Thorazine, now they had to find different ways to treat people. So what better way than to go in the community and have an office and bring in uh, your everyday person or your executive under high stress or mama who's taking care of all the kids and they needed some way to create a therapy for them. In 1955, that drug was approved. Its name was Milltown, the first of the so-called minor tranquilizers. But to sell their new class of psychiatric drugs to the public, psychiatrists and drug companies first had to reposition them as working on a disease process, rather than just as sedating or restraining agents for undesirable human behaviors, as Thorazine had been. To do this, they began a marketing blitz on their colleagues, placing print advertisements in professional publications, such as the American Journal of Psychiatry. Prominent psychiatrists were then hired to spread the word to the rest of the medical field. Few knew that Nathan Klein, one of the most influential psychiatrists of his time, was being paid by the drug industry when he proclaimed that tranquilizers such as Milltown were equal in importance to the introduction of atomic energy, if not more so. Free samples were shipped to psychiatrists and physicians to get patients started on the drug. A year later, the marketing rollout hit the public, and Milltown soon became the first blockbuster psychiatric drug, not just for those incarcerated in an insane asylum, but for the mainstream public. Milltown was marketed to pregnant women, stay-at-home moms, and busy white-collar office workers, who called it executive excedrin. So it opened up a door for community-based mental health. Uh, whereby the psychiatrist could then have a role. So uh, they became very uh, closely associated with the pharmaceutical industry. And they were demanding as well to come up with better things for mom and pop and the executive and uh, the superstar uh, Hollywood actress or actor. And uh, soon, you know, it became a fashion to take some of these medications. By the 1960s, 36 million prescriptions for Milltown had been filled in the United States alone, accounting for $200 million in sales, 
an amount unheard of at that time for any psychiatric drug. Milltown's success led to the introduction of many more psychiatric drugs aimed at the general public throughout the 1950s and 60s. One such drug was Valium. Launched to the delirious acclaim of psychiatrists and the press, Valium was so widely prescribed to stressed out housewives that it even acquired a nickname, Mother's Little Helper. Lost amidst this hoopla was strong and well-documented early evidence that tranquilizers also came with serious, life-changing side effects. Milltown, for example, was soon labeled by the 1962 President's Advisory Commission on Narcotic and Drug Abuse as more dangerous and addictive even than cocaine or methamphetamine and fell quickly out of use. But the psychiatric community ignored these warnings. Pandora's box had been opened, and with their new pills, they were no longer caretakers of the insane. They were real doctors, administering drugs to patients. And their backward logic was, if the drugs did indeed shut down mental symptoms, weren't they therefore addressing some physical disease in the brain? Within years, this reasoning enabled psychiatry to undergo a profound change. Psychiatrists were no longer caretakers, they were doctors. Mental complaints were no longer psychological, they were symptoms of disease. And to treat them, psychiatrists wrote them prescriptions. It's all about money. The use of uh, writing prescriptions and uh, having an income from people coming in and getting their prescriptions and this, that, and the other is what uh, revived the psychiatric community. It was the thing that put them back where they were earning money again. Business was going so well that a group of prominent psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico in 1967 to lay out the expansion of psychotropic drug use for the year 2000. According to organizing psychiatrist Dr. Wayne O. Evans, Psychomedication is now an accepted way of life, and the search for the just right pill has become the goal for many people. By the early 1980s, Valium had become the most widely prescribed drug of any kind in the Western world. In 1978 alone, nearly 2.3 billion tablets sold, enough to medicate one half of the world population. The business of psychotropic drugging had gotten so out of hand that at a 1979 hearing on the use and abuse of benzodiazepines, one United States senator commented that. The whole pitch appears to be to, to sell, market, sell and market. But bigger things were yet to come. The next drug that became a rage was Prozac. And of course, Prozac was not for anxiety, but for depression. And all of a sudden, the, the diagnosis of depression uh, starts uh, multiply. The, the number of people who are diagnosed as being depressed starts multiplying substantially. Prozac was released amid great fanfare with tales of miraculous recoveries, sick minds made well, and ruined lives restored and all with almost no side effects or addiction, or so its manufacturer claimed. Many new antidepressants quickly followed, also pitching instant psychological relief with little downside. And with this, mainstream psychiatry abandoned psychotherapy for pharmacology forever. In a bold and effective marketing coup, the world was told that these new antidepressant drugs were not just for the depressed, but lifestyle drugs for a choose-your-mood society. But almost immediately, evidence emerged that claims of universal safety and effectiveness were far from the truth. The adverse side effects of this class of drugs includes things like sexual dysfunction, agitation, uh, facial uh, involuntary movements of the face. Uh, some of the psychiatrists in their books describe the tongue darting in and out of the mouth as an adverse side effect of SSRI drugs. Within 10 years, staggering details of side effects such as violence and suicide could no longer be ignored, with an estimated 3.9 million adverse events on Prozac alone. Black box warnings alerting the public to significant risks of violence and suicide were issued, once again against loud protests from drug companies and organized psychiatry. But when the patents of antidepressants expired, 
Just as predictably, psychiatrists and drug makers finally admitted the truth. But now they claimed, here was a new scientific breakthrough that would change everything. A new class of drugs called the atypical antipsychotic. Newly approved to treat both schizophrenia and a then obscure mental disorder dubbed bipolar disorder. Suddenly, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder became the rage, with diagnosis rates soaring by thousands of percentage points in a matter of years. What is clear is that the patents run out and uh, the drug companies are always looking to maximize their profits, so they uh, research new drugs and they can keep them patented for about 17 years and charge monopoly prices. And then when the patent wears off, uh, often the next one comes along. Soon, however, atypical antipsychotics, like all their predecessors, were revealed as having crippling and even deadly side effects, such as obesity, diabetes, and even heart problems, along with questionable efficacy and almost certain dependency. Pharmaceutical companies are trying to get away from the old style Thorazines and into the new uh, antipsychotics, and we know that they're no better. So today's new an improved antipsychotic is no better than the old Thorazine, which was the miracle drug for psychiatry. Today, the same cycle continues with breathless news coverage of new chemical treatments promoted as breakthroughs. Even hallucinogens such as LSD and ecstasy are